Order. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Polly. Is the proposal supported? Oh, gee. Okay, thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for Mr Morrison to apologise for his role overseeing every aspect of the illegal robo-debt scheme as the Social Services Minister who designed it, the Treasurer who implemented it and the Prime Minister who settled the claims of victims for $1.2 billion and to establish a Royal Commission because that's the only way we need a forum with the coercive powers and broad jurisdiction necessary to properly investigate this fiasco. I've always liked numbers, so let's start with some numbers for those opposite who were all complicit in the 430,000 Australians who were illegally issued with robo-debt notices. Yes, 400,000 Australians targeted by the former Social Services Minister, former Treasurer and now Prime Minister of Australia. A $1.2 billion payout, which is the biggest class action settlement in Australian government history. How about a round of applause for those opposite? You made history, guys. Congratulations. You have cost the Australian taxpayer $1.2 billion. Then again, what's $1.2 billion to those opposite who are racking up a trillion dollars in national debt, the worst economic managers in the history of this country? We know on this side, and the Australian people know, that ministerial responsibility is dead in this country. And if there doesn't prove this, then I don't know what will. The arrogance of this government, who were forewarned that their actions were illegal. The automation process and the computerisation of the robo-debt was a decision made by the current government. Those opposite cannot escape that fact as much as they would like to retry, because we know how often they come into this place and try and rewrite history. But those opposite haven't been advised that the scheme was illegal, and it took them months and months to act on this and to stop sending the debt notices out to vulnerable Australians. This could have been fixed quickly by the government, but instead they were dragged through the court process because of their ideological bent of they know best all the time and they are never wrong. Well, justice was served. The judiciary made a judgment, and now the taxpayer is forced to pay because of the utter incompetence and arrogance of those opposite. Now, let's be clear here. 430,000 welfare recipients were wrongly accused by the Turnbull and Morrison governments of misreporting their income. This was an, an appalling injustice done to people who couldn't defend themselves. The callous, ruthless and impersonal way of pursuing welfare recipients was always brutal, and you can understand why it was designed by Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, and is right up his alley. In the words of Mr Bill Shorten, who stood up for the 430,000 victims of this government, the Morrison government has been forced to give the money of those people back to them. Let's not forget that when Labor first raised the concerns of the 430,000 harassed and aggrieved Australians that received robo-debt notices, it was Stuart Roberts, the government's service minister and the prime minister who said it was merely a political stunt. Can you believe that? We know the mentality of those opposite. They want to stigmatise people on Centrelink, 
stigmatise people who receive money from the Commonwealth. They demonise people. They talk them down. And during this whole fiasco, the Prime Minister just said, "There's nothing to see here. Move along." No one has been aggrieved. Well, how wrong was the Prime Minister? We knew all along that they were in the wrong. Well, Prime Minister, $1.2 billion of taxpayer money is not moving along. It's the taxpayers' money, and you, sir, cannot be trusted with the Australian Treasury anymore. This entire calamity could have been avoided if not for your philosophical hatred of people who receive welfare and at some point in their lives to make a fresh start, to be provide assistance for a short time in order to get back on their feet. The government has paid out $1.2 billion in the biggest settlement in Australian government history, and yet they argue that they are not liable. This isn't a comedy set, Mr Morrison. You take the Australian people for granted every single day. This government cannot run, around, run away from this issue like they try and run away from accountability and transparency every other day. The government is yet to explain how this scheme was so poorly administered. And the question must be asked. How did we get ourselves into a set of circumstances where ministers either knew that the law was being broken or never bothered to find out what the law was? How do we get to the situation where senior public servants, not the Centrelink staff at the counter, but the senior public service authorised a scheme which was illegal? There is a human toll to this whole fiasco. 430,000 people and their families who endured the torment and shame, and it is shame, of being hunted and victimised by their government. The government's actions did and has consequences on people's lives. I know those people on that side, they really don't give a damn. They don't. Otherwise, they would have thought before they acted. They couldn't get jobs because they had a debt finding. To families and people who had shame and stigma, a lot of people who don't want to be on Centrelink and were embarrassed about their debt. Whether they really had a debt or not, they still felt that shame. People were mistreated and they deserve a sincere apology from the Prime Minister, from Minister Robert and from those opposite. I want to conclude by acknowledging that the settlement is justice for the victims who have been treated terribly, shamefully, by the Morrison government. For years, the Morrison government has been in denial about robo-debt's fairness and legality, even after the robo-debt scheme was proven through the courts to be illegal. What have we seen? Nothing in the way of an apology from either the Prime Minister or Minister Roberts. We know the anxiety. We know the extra poverty that was caused. And we even know that there were suicides because of the shame and for those who couldn't fight what they perceived to be the government who would have to be in the right when they couldn't prove that they didn't own a debt some of those people, unfortunately, took their own lives. Their families have been left devastated. devastated. It is only after the prospect of co coalition ministers, such as the former Minister for Health Services, Alan Trudge, having to take the witness stand to answer questions on what they knew that the government has now agreed to pay a fair amount of compensation to these victims. What is the dirty secret about robo-debt's origins that the government doesn't want anyone to know? Were they told it was illegal and, in, and ignored that advice from the outset? Did they not check its legality at all before unleashing it on unsuspecting public? How much taxpayer money has the Morrison government wasted fighting this unwinnable case? Only a royal commission 
into the robo-debt will give the public the answers that they deserve. In the meantime, Mr Morrison should have sacked Minister Roberts. Everything that guy touches turns to stone. He's hopeless. He's undefensible in terms of his actions and the stupidity of the way this whole fiasco was handled. There's so many on that side of the chamber that don't deserve to be ministers. We've got Richard Colbeck, another failed minister in his responsibilities. And Stuart Roberts is almost like the gift that keeps on giving. Every single time he has his fingers in a pie, it turns to stone. This has been a national disgrace Senator, and it's a scandal. Your time has expired. So that's you. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the matter of importance regarding Centrelink's income compliance program raised by Senator Polly. It is important for Senator Polly and those opposite to keep in mind that in a circumstance where Australians have received money from the taxpayer to which they were not entitled, the government would seek to recover that money. The Australian public expects the government to do that, and that is what has been done and continues to be done. Our social security system requires income support recipients to meet eligibility requirements around income and assets to ensure support is being provided to those who need it most. The welfare system is an important safety net, but equally requires compliance measures to be undertaken so people receive the correct payment and meet their obligations. Such compliance includes checking discrepancies between reported income to identify potential overpayments and, as appropriate, recover debts. This is a welfare system that is sustainable and one that has integrity. However, before I speak further about debts raised via the Income Compliance Program, I wish to address a serious issue that has been repeatedly brought up in Parliament in relation to this program and has again this afternoon. I'm speaking about mental health and, specifically, the claims around suicides resulting from this Income Compliance Program. Mental health is one of the biggest challenges of our society. The Australian government takes mental health seriously, so seriously that the Prime Minister appointed Christine Morgan as the National Suicide Prevention Advisor last year. We are taking action on mental health so families, communities and people experiencing trauma can, can get the support they need. The Suicide Prevention Task Force briefed the Senate Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the Centrelink compliance program. Task Force representatives told the committee, of which I am the deputy chair, that research indicates there is no single reason why someone dies by suicide. Drawing mental health into this debate does not help matters. In fact, it hinders them. It is time for par my parliamentary colleagues on all sides to treat this issue with sensitivity so as not to place undue stress and trauma on those impacted by it. In dealing with mental health at the agency level, Services Australia has an extensive social worker net network to support in such critical situations. This social, net social worker network can be reached by calling 132 850. Too much is at stake to make people's mental health a political issue. Activities and policies relating to the recovery of money from Social Security recipients who have been overpaid, either inadvertently or through deliberate fraud, are known as the Income Compliance Program. The specific Income Compliance Program we are discussing here today was established in 2015 through the Better Management of the Social Welfare System measure announced in the 2015-16 budget. Resolving discrepancies and errors in Social Security payments including errors of overpayment, is a routine part of the administration of Australia's social security system. This has been the case for many decades, with a range of integrity measures adopted during that time, including the Income Compliance Program. As a result of feedback, the program has been through various iterations. The Income Compliance Program, built on existing income compliance previous programs and was designed to identify social security overpayments through discrepancies between the annual income reported by an individual to Centrelink up to seven years before the date of review and income assessed by the Australian Taxation Office for that same period. 
Discrepancies were identified by averaging lump sum income assessed by the ATO over the period the income was earned in and compared to earnings reported to and income support received from Centrelink across the same period. Data matching and income averaging processes like the practice I have just described have been used as a tool to help identify potential social security overpayments since at least the 1990s, with taxation information used to inform the practice since 2004. The methodology of averaging income was provided for in the Social Security Act 1991 and its predecessor, the Social Security Act 1947. The first data matching program was established under the Data Matching Program Assistance and Tax Act 1990 and involved an exchange of data about an individual's taxable income between the ATO and relevant government departments. Services Australia undertook a review of income compliance debts raised in 2009 and 2011 using a random sample of 500 cases in each year. The analysis found that 16.8 per cent of the sampled debts in 2009 were raised through the use of averaged ATO income data and 24.4 per cent in 2011. And noting that averaging of ATO income information was used when other information was not available or when people did not engage with Centrelink. Minister Stuart Robert announced changes to the income compliance program in November 2019 when announcing that averaged ATO income by itself was an insufficient basis upon which to raise a debt. Further proof points were needed. Since Minister Roberts' announcements about changes to the program, Services Australia has engaged with more than 35 organisations and advocacy groups. It has also undertaken 17 user research activities, piloted the refund process, engaged with the Ombudsman's Office on draft refund letters and met with representatives from the Civil Society Advisory Group, with further updates on the agency's progress in refunding customers. Services Australia has made a number of changes to its systems to improve the user experience, including in introducing registered mail to guarantee delivery of letters before reviews start, and dedicated phone support and assistance from compliance officers to help recipients understand what will happen and is required during a review. In his April 2019 report, the Commonwealth Ombudsman commented positively on this enhanced customer experience, including improved letters and income compliance correspondence. And now, simplified income reporting combined with single-touch payroll means information can be accessed more easily, which will reduce errors. The court case to which Senator Polly refers in this matter, the Income Compliance Program Class Action, or Prigadix versus the Commonwealth, was the result of using income averaging to determine debts. We now know and acknowledge that this was not a valid method to determine debts. In June this year, the Prime Minister apologised to the people who had been impacted by that method of determining debts to be collected. The Department of Social Services and Service Australia also apologised for the harm and hurt caused by the program and committed to applying lessons learnt from it in the future. Importantly, as soon as this government became aware that this method of debt calculation was invalid, the practice was immediately stopped. Those Australians who received debt notices resulting from income averaging were paid back that money. As at the 30th of November, $707.7 million has, had been refunded to 406,889 people. This accounts for around 95 per cent of people affected and 95 per cent of refunds by value. Around 23,100 people are still to be refunded and or have their debt zeroed if they hadn't made any payments. Under the settlement, the Commonwealth will make a payment of $112 million in the nature of interest to be distributed to eligible group members. It should be noted, however, that using this method to determine debt is not something this government, current government has developed. It was actually something the Labor Party came up with and supported. Indeed, the then Minister for Human Services, Tanya Plibersek, said on the 29th of June 2011, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. This statement was backed up by Bill Shorten, who said the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers on the same day. 
Senator Polly has called for a Royal Commission to investigate the Income Compliance Program. A court case on this matter has already been finalised and the settlement agreed. While a Royal Commission provides a high level of investigation and inquiry, which is at times warranted and vital to ensure complex issues are investigated thoroughly, it is not a court and does not exercise judicial power. In the words of former Chief Justice of the High Court, Justice Gibbs, a Royal Commission is a mere inquiry which cannot lead to judgment. Further, Justice Gibbs said, Royal Commissions act in a purely inquisitorial capacity. The coronavirus pandemic has resulted in a temporary pause on debt collection activity to help ease the pressure on household budgets. However, existing income compliance debts will continue to be subject to recovery, ensuring the integrity of Australia's welfare system. The Prime Minister, the Department of Social Services and Services Australia has already apologised for the impact of the debt recovery practice during this income compliance program. The debt amounts repaid to those impacted, the court case settled and additional compensation agreed. A further inquiry in the form of a Royal Commission is unnecessary and Senator unwarranted. Askew, Thank you. Your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy Pre Acting Deputy President. I rise somewhat out of breath to contribute to this debate, which is, of course, about the need for Mr Morrison to apologise for his role overseeing every aspect of the illegal robo-debt scheme as the social service minister who designed it, the treasurer who implemented it and the prime minister who settled the claims of victims for $1.2 billion and to establish a royal commission because that is the only forum with the coercive powers and the broad jurisdiction necessary to properly investigate this fiasco. And I agree. We absolutely need a royal commission because this government settled the robo-debt, and I will always call it robo-debt, despite what the government says, because it was robo-debt. And it was illegal. This fiddling around with language to say it's legally insufficient, it was illegal. And the government has settled this case because they didn't want, they didn't want public servants who knew what went on and ministers who knew what went on to be called into court to actually establish when they knew this was illegal, when they knew it was illegal. And they must have known because we established in estimates just a couple of weeks ago, we went through the process of the AAT. Now, either they weren't reading the reports of the AAT, and quite clearly, at estimates, we were told people had been reading them. We were told the process that you go through when an AAT process and decision is made. And there's been a number, a large number of cases that must have clearly pointed out that these debts were not legally based. So this government doesn't want people in court being asked questions that may be slightly inconvenient. So of course they settled the class action. Of course they settled it. That's why we need a royal commission to forensically analyse what went on, who knew what, when and where that information is held. We need to also go back before 2015 because these debts, this process isn't going back before 2015 and we can't get access through, when I say we, the Community Affairs Com References Committee that is inquiring into the Centrelink compliance program, who has asked for various bits of information, and the government won't provide that under the claims of public interest immunity, including executive minutes, including their decision-making process for why uh, looking at debts prior to 2015. Now, that information is, in my opinion, in the public interest to release it. But no, will this government release it? No, they won't. They hide behind public interest immunity. But they think that because they've now 
settling, not quite settled yet, because it still, I, I know, has to go through the final approval process. But they have effectively, they have agreed to settle, because they think that people will stop asking questions about when they knew it was illegal, who knew it was illegal. Why didn't the Prime Minister, who was then the Minister for Social Services when this new accelerated process of income averaging turbocharged through robo-debt, when that was introduced? The Prime Minister knew then. Then he became the Treasurer and now he's the Prime Minister. What did he know? What did he know about it? What did all the other ministers who we've had? Let me remember. Christian Porter. Oh, yeah, he's the Attorney General. We've had Dan Tehan. We've had Alan Tudge. We've had Stuart Robert a couple of times as the Minister for Human Services and now the, ministers for, the Minister for Service Australia. What none of them asked, and now the, minister, the current Minister for Social Services, Minister Rustin, did they not ask, oh, is this legal? What's the legal basis for this? Of course, they must have asked those questions. We also, talk, the, the, we also need to discuss the issue around the apology. Now, would this count as an apology? I ask this question. I would apologise for any hurt or harm in the way that the government has dealt with that issue and to anybody else who has found themselves in those circumstances situation. Of course, I would deeply regret any hardship that has been caused to people in the conduct of that activity. This is the Prime Minister's so-called apology. What, he doesn't know that there's people were hurt by this? Hundreds of thousands of people subjected to their illegal, illegal robo-debt fiasco? People articulating very clearly the hurt and distress. And if he bothered, if he hadn't listened to any of the radio stories about it, watched any of the TV stories about it, read any of the media, media articles about it, you would have thought that one of the ministers, particularly the Prime Minister, would have had a look at the Senate inquiry and the Hansard transcripts, which clearly articulated people's deep, deep distress and anxiety. So when he says any hurt or harm, of course there's hurt and harm. We know there's the worst possible harm because we know, because we've had evidence from families about the impact on people's mental ill health to the point and distress and anxiety to the point where we know that some people as a result of robo-debt did take their lives. That is the most distressing, awful thing for the people that took their lives and for their families. And we've had evidence to the Senate inquiry, and I've had it personally from families, about the impact that robo debt had. Everybody in this country knows that it caused hurt and harm and distress. So that is not an apology. That is not a heartfelt apology that acknowledges the hurt, harm, anxiety, stress that it has caused hundreds of thousands of people. Because the government, once again, was picking and demonising people on income support and thought they could save money, in fact recoup, so-called recoup money, over the most vulnerable members of our community. This government has, and, and started in fact with the Howard government, demonising people on income support, accusing people with disability of rorting the system, saying, subjecting them to welfare to work, and that continued on. That continued on through the Howard, through, past the Howard government into the Abbott government. 
where he accused people of sitting. Mr. A Mr. Abbott, as Prime Minister, accused people of on the dole sitting on the couch. Accused people of rorting the disability pension or the income support system. So this was the mindset that was used to dream up robo debt, while the now Prime Minister was the Minister for Social Services. In other words, the person entrusted to look after Australians, to support Australians who are most vulnerable and most in need. What did, what did the now Prime Minister oversee was the start and the initiation of the robo-debt scheme to make money off the backs of those very people that, as minister, he should have been working for and to ensure got support that they needed. Not letters saying you could owe thousands of dollars. And when you get a letter or the debt collector turns up at your door, which is what happened to people, and say you own thousands of money, it has the most significant impact on you. This has caused deep hurt and trauma, and it needs a full apology and a royal commission. Thank you, Senator Seward. Well, this gives me great pleasure to welcome Senator Billick. Now, which camera do I look at? Can you hear me, Mr. Yes, Acting Senator Justice Billick. President? Okay. That Thanks, one? Mr. Sorry. Senator Billick. Thank you. I speak today about the matter of public importance, that is, robo debt, and the Prime Minister's failure to accept fault for his actions as Minister, Treasurer, and Prime Minister. He's completed a trifecta that nobody would want to win on a program that was illegal and executed atrociously. He was the minister who designed robo debt. He was the treasurer that cashed the money from robo debt, and the prime minister who refused to fix it. We can look at the numbers, and they're large, but what are we dealing with? We're not dealing with numbers. We're dealing with the lives of hundreds of thousands of fellow Australians. Hundreds of thousands of Australians who have been put through unnecessary stress and heartache of having to disprove their liability for debts that they didn't owe, of being treated so badly that some of them did take their own life, and I'll come to that in a while. And they've been put through this heartache because of the callousness and the incompetence of Mr Morrison and his government. So those opposite, they can try to defend their position and deny the undeniable and talk about mental health programs implemented, but the reality is that this government caused the angst and anxiety felt by participants caught up in the robo-debt fiasco. It's all on them. Now, I'm a member of the Community Affairs Reference, References Committee. As uh, Senator Seward said, we're undertaking an inquiry into Centrelink's compliance program, as robo-debt is formally known. And as a member of that committee, I've heard evidence and read submissions from witnesses whose lives were completely devastated by the program. And we heard some really distressing evidence. Let me tell you about Ms Kath Madwick, who believes her son Jared's robo-debt contributed to him eventually taking his own life. She wrote a letter to the committee that was read into evidence during a public hearing of the committee. And I'll just quote a part of it. She said, my son Jared Madwick was an amazing, caring, intelligent boy. He was a loving and protective son. And if it were not for the automated compliance letter and the threat of a debt, Jared would have been sabotaging my cooking with cayenne pepper and giving me his cheeky giggle when he got caught that night, and my son would be sitting next to me today. Instead, he was extremely distressed, and it pushed him to make an impulsive decision. Jared was not planning his death. He was desperately applying for jobs, and he had an interview scheduled with the Army on the 4th of June. So I'd just like to express my condolences to Miss Madwick and her family, as well as to all the families who lost a loved one because of this awful program. But what's been truly shocking to me has been the reaction of the government and some of its officials. During that same hearing of the committee, a department official refused to accept that there were suicides caused by this program. This was even after being presented with the test testimony of uh, Mrs Madwick that I've just quoted. And Ms Madwick is not the only grieving parent to have made this claim. So I really think it's time for the government to take seriously the parents and the loved ones 
But those who have taken their lives, they were saying this program pushed them over the edge because lives were ruined by this program. Lives were lost because of this program. And yesterday in question time in the Senate, the government warned us about speaking about the lives lost, supposedly out of a sense of respect. But I say this. It's a damn shame they didn't have that same sense of respect when they were harassing people about debts they didn't owe. 430,000 people was treated as cheats and debtors by the government, and they paid the government thousands of dollars when they didn't owe them a cent. The government didn't show Australians respect, and instead of admitting fault, former robo-debt minister Stuart Robert denied for months that the standover scheme was unfair, inaccurate or illegal. Instead, the government spent years trying to defend the program, dragged its feet on the class action for months, and then finally, just on the cusp of the trial, but without admitting any liability, they decided to settle. And I agree with Senator Seawood when she says that it's because those ministers would not want to have to stand up in a court of law and swear that what they were saying was the truth. We've got Minister Porter, the Attorney General and former Minister for Social Services. He still doesn't show respect when he continues to call the dodgy scheme legally insufficient rather than downright illegal, which it's been shown to be. And I think the government's understanding of respect needs to be seriously reconsidered. It's not showing respect to raise debts through illegal means, often for thousands of dollars, against people who are struggling to get by already. And shamefully, this program seems to have targeted particularly vulnerable people. I would like to take a few moments just to outline a case that appeared in the media. So Mr Christopher Pascoe is a 53-year-old man living with epilepsy and an intellectual disability. In July 2018, he received notice of a debt of over $15,000 from Centrelink. Now, the department alleged there was a mismatch between the income he declared to the, to the department dating from 2013 to 2016 compared to what he actually earned. Well, Mr Pascoe doesn't declare his income to Centrelink, which is a common arrangement for people who have a disability that limits their ability to handle their own finances. Mr Pascoe's mother has described the situation as, and I quote, it's really sort of disability bullying to me. Centrelink subsequently admitted that they made a mistake, wiping $5,000 off the debt in February 2019, before offering to waive the debt after his story was aired on the ABC show at 7.30. Now, it shouldn't have to take going to national media to get an incorrectly raised debt wiped. This scheme has caused enormous heartache, but the government refuses to take responsibility. And under persistent questioning by Labor, in and out of the parliament, uh, the minister, uh, the former minister, Stuart Robert, has said, we will not apologise and spoke about the integrity of the welfare system. I'd like to remind the minister that an integrity isn't illegally stealing hundreds of millions of dollars from hundreds of thousands of vulnerable Australians. Robo-debt victims need and deserve an apology from Minister Robert. And we need a proper apology from the Prime Minister, who will only say he has deep regret. I mean, seriously, that was not an apology. If an apology isn't genuine, it's not worth the breath people use to say it. But more than an apology, we need to determine what went wrong and how. And the Australian people have a right to know and deserve to know who was actually res responsible. So we need to determine how it happened, that ministers either knew that the law was being broken and did nothing about it, or never bothered even to find out if the law, law had been broken in the first place. We need to discover how we got into the situation with senior public servants authorising a scheme which was illegal. Because if we don't know how this disaster occurred, how can we ensure that it won't happen again? So, Labor is calling for a Royal Commission into robo-debt and we will continue to do so because it is the most appropriate way to investigate this absolutely disastrous policy. Royal Commissions have broad powers to hold public hearings, call witnesses under oath and compel evidence. So I can see why the government don't want to have one. And we've seen the power of Royal Commissions recently with the Disability Royal Commission as well as the Royal Commission into Aged Care and Quality and Safety. And in both of these cases, 
What we already knew was shocking, but what was revealed through the Royal Commission's proceedings was even worse. So it begs the question, how bad is what we don't already know about the robo-debt debacle? How bad is it? Now, it's important to remember that robo-debt was the brainchild of Mr Morrison when he was Minister for Social Services. And he was the treasurer who announced it. And finally, he was the Prime Minister who failed to stop the implementation of his own botched policy. And now the government have to pay out $1.2 billion in refunds, debt eliminations and compensations. So that explains why we can't find out what the government knew and when. I, I really think there's a fair bit of the PM protecting his own bum going on here. Only the Royal Commission can determine what really happened and who is to blame. The fact that it took the biggest class action in Australian history before the government finally started to put things right is extremely disappointing. Because the government knew years ago that things weren't right. They had made an enormous change to the system without thinking through the practical outcomes or the legalities. And while governments had previously matched ATO data with Centrelink data, this government automated it and took out the human oversight element, moving from 20,000 cases a year to 20,000 cases a week. It was once due as the last resort, but under this government, it just turned into an extortion racket. The government unjustly enriched itself with $720 million that was stolen from vulnerable Australians, and it did so at the cost of over Order, $600 Order, Senator Billick, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, I love a good novel, love a good bit of creative writing, but this parliament is no place for creative writing. It's no place for rewriting history. It's no place for the weaving of fantasy novels in the context of parliamentary speeches, because Labor would have you believe that income averaging and debt recovery all had its beginnings in 2015. And the fact, I take these interjections from Senator Pratt because the very fact that she insists on yelling perpetually over me shows how much she wants to go la 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 and pretend she doesn't have to hear the truth. But the facts are these, and the Australian people have more open mindedness than we'll get from Senator Pratt. So, when it comes to the issue of when debt recovery started, it's important to understand that this government did not invent income averaging. Income averaging has been a program in our Centrelink compliance system for a very long time. We actually need to go back not five years, not 10 years, but 26 years. So let's take a look at the evidence, but first let's put a bit of a definition around the term robo-debt, because it's used as a bit of a slogan by those opposite to cover all manner of ills. But in the minds of Australians, the, the mum and dads who might be listening at home, robo-debt means the use of computers to compare actual income with declared income, to work out if there's any kind of discrepancies and to make sure that a person is getting the right amount in their welfare cheque. Now, I've got a letter right here sent to an Australian citizen in 1994 under the Keating Labor government about data matching pertaining to their new start allowance. And it says, if you do not reply, we will use the tax officer's information about your income and we will write to you about how much money you need to pay back. I've also got here from 1994 the Department of Social Services example letter that was used in all cases at that time to alert citizens of the fact of ATO income matching processes going on in relation to their Centrelink account. Now, these letters, these letters demonstrate that data matching, income averaging and ATO cross-checks were all commonplace under what was the last Labor government to deliver a budget surplus. Now, a far cry, I would suggest, from the allegations that are made in the text of this matter of public importance. So let's fast forward now to the next Labor government. In 2011, the Gillard government 
introduced an automated system of cross-matching data from two agencies. And I've done my homework. I've got a couple of documents here that prove it. First, a joint press release from 2011 by the then Human Services Minister, Ms Plibersek, and Assistant Treasurer, Mr Shorten, announcing an automated system of income matching from the Tax Office and Centrelink. Sounds an awful lot like robo-debt to me, but it's titled New Data Matching to Recover Millions in Welfare Dollars. It states, if people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts, the government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. It goes on to state the automation there's a key word Senator Pratt won't like the automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of taxpayers. Now, if that's not enough for you, Madam Acting Deputy President, I've also got here a press release from the member from McMahon. Yes, Mr Bowen. And on it, he boasts Centrelink conducted 3.8 million payment reviews, resulting in the reduction of 641,000 payments, saving $2.27 billion using, you guessed it, data matching. Um, robo debt, no less. And I also have right here an article from the Australian well respected newspaper titled Labor Flip Flops on Robo Debt System that Shorten Plibersek pioneered. It goes on to state, in what must be devastating words for those opposite, Labor's leadership team of Bill Shorten and Tanya Plibersek pioneered the robo-debt data matching system Centrelink is using to target current and former welfare recipients for apparently not declaring their income properly, but now they argue it should be suspended. Now, that's really very interesting to me, given the, um, the outrage, the confected outrage, the, the froth and bubble we get from those opposite, because you'd think from the way that they're talking, this was a recent invention. But no, no, that's not the case at all. So if you don't like the Australian or if you're inclined to say, oh, that's just some right-wing rag, don't believe them, well, the far-left publication of The Guardian decided that it also met their test. And when you're getting the same thing published, in The Australian and in The Guardian, those opposite love to quote The Guardian, then I think you can feel a little bit more comfortable that we aren't mincing things up. Now, The Guardian concedes that the automated income matching process was designed and implemented by Mr Shorten and Ms Plibersek. The Guardian article states, the former Labor government did introduce the process. You wouldn't know it from what we're hearing from those opposite. In fact, even all the way up until last year, Labor was all aboard the robo-debt train. And so when they protest now, it's just not very convincing. So let's do another little fact check. The policy costings that Labor took to the 2019 federal election were released by the Parliamentary Budget Office. And when you have a little dig through those, you notice they haven't made any of the changes that would be needed in their costings to reflect a reversal of the policy of robo-debt. In fact, Labor's social security policies, the ones they brought to the 2019 federal election, the very team we see opposite, did not include the reversal of the policy of using robo-debt. Labor's own budget plans from the 2019 federal election did not include that reversal. In fact, they banked the expected savings from the operation of the robo-debt program to fund their big spending election commitments. And they stand here and tell us they had nothing to do with it. 
It's pretty galling, if you ask me. You know, it's another one of those occasions where it's fair to say that hypocrisy by name is Labor. And so when Mr Shorten couldn't defend his own tragic record on robo-debt when interviewed last year by journalist Patricia Cavallis, even she wasn't buying the line. She said, you've spoken today about how much harm this program has done. Do you regret creating it and do you not regret opposing it before the election? Mr Shorten said, Labor didn't create it. And Ms Kavala said, yeah, no, Labor did create robo-debt. I know. I've watched it. I did. Mr Shorten says, Patricia, this is not government propaganda hour. And Ms Kavala says, yeah, but you created this computer-generated system, right? And of course, the truth was a little too awkward to bear. In fact, social welfare activist Asha Wolfe also knows Labor's hypocrisy when it comes to robo-debt. She tweeted on the 30th of May this year, quote, Shorten only jumped on board the campaign against robo-debt after he lost the 2019 election, close quote. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, we know that income averaging and the automation of data cross-checking is an intergenerational Labor scheme, invented, designed and championed by two Labor governments. It's Labor who should be apologising. They should be apologising for failing to be frank with the Australian people. It's Labor who should be apologising for their short memories or their creative writing or their looseness with the truth. Or maybe they should also apologise for their list of epic fails in boats, pink bats, cash for clunkers, Order, school halls. Senator Stoke, we can add this expired. one. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And that indeed was a very, very unfortunate contribution to this debate because it neither it neither it, it neither accepted the hurt to 400,000 Australians that this government's robo debt has impacted on, and neither did it seem to take the matter seriously. It was an absolute disgrace that contribution, because this is indeed a very grave and serious matter of public importance. For 400,000 of Australians, this is a deeply personal and painful matter, because their own government effectively lied about them and stole from them. Now, you can only accept two things. Either that was their objective in the first place, they were just out there to get money back to to bolster their bottom line, or they're just incompetent. It can only be one or the, or the other. So I'd be happy, and I'm sure the 400,000 people that they vilified would be happy if they could just fess up. But what this government did with the robo-debt, they did with a very heavy hand, meeting out pain, suffering, based on flimsy and false evidence that debts were owed. It did so in particularly galling fashion, in a patronising way, saying to everyone, to everyday Australians, pretty much like the contribution we just received, very patronising. You know you, know you owe us money. We know best. Don't challenge us. Fess up. Cough up. Only these Australians had done nothing wrong. They didn't owe the government any money. There was no debt, only a fantasy debt dreamed up by the social services minister, desperate to, to prove himself by um, preying on the weak and vulnerable, because that's the sort of thing that earns you brownie points among the Liberal Party circles of the chattering classes. As social services minister Scott Morrison bragged and boasted about this illegal scheme, designed with intent to scare, intimidate and to thrash, thrash about with the big stick. Only the people on the receiving end, many hundreds of thousands of ordinary Australians, had done nothing, absolutely nothing wrong. They didn't deserve this treatment. The damage to people's mental and physical health wrought from this scheme has been profound. In the state that I represent, over 15,000 Tasmanians are estimated to be victims of this Prime Minister's botched, dodgy, dehumanising, indeed malevolent scheme. It was his scheme as Social Services Minister. He designed it, 
As Treasurer, Mr Morrison was the implementer and the enforcer of this scheme. And now, as Prime Minister, he has been forced to come to the biggest settlement of any Australian government in history over this illegal scheme, a $1.2 billion settlement. What a blunder, what a backflip, what a disgrace. And yes, why this settlement, as humiliating and as humbling as it must be, goes some way towards justice for everyday Australians who are victims of this illegal scheme, the fact is they deserve so much more. They deserve more from their government. Australian governments are vested with the responsibility of protecting Australian people, securing them from harm and predatory behaviour. Only in this instance, it was their own government the Australian people had to fear. The victims of this illegal scheme deserve nothing less than a royal commission, because a royal commission is the only forum vested with coercive powers and broad juris jurisdiction that can properly investigate this blight on our nation. This fa fiasco of the Prime Minister's own making, the truly extraordinary thing about this scandal is that it has, been, has followed this Prime Minister through every portfolio he's held since the coalition has come to office. It was his baby as social services minister. It was, it was meant to be his cash cow as tre treasurer. And as Prime Minister, it landed him, in this, him a spot in history as the man responsible for the largest ever settlement by a government in Australian class action history. That is why he remains uninterested in getting to the bottom of this matter. He's uninterested in finding the truth, uninterested in the transparency needed to reveal just how badly this went wrong, uninterested in holding anyone to account, because the person who needs to be held to account more than any other in this sorry saga is none other than the Prime Minister himself. No wonder he hasn't held anyone to account for it. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Income Compliance Program. The term robo-debt was first used in 2016 in relation to debt raised through the Online Compliance Intervention Program. The catch-all robo-debt name has been used incorrectly for all Centrelink debts, creating confusion amongst the Australian public. Labor would have you believe that they would do things differently, but in fact, Labor created this computer-generated system while it was in, well, it was in fact in government. You might remember that because you probably won't see it again for a while. Anthony Albanese cannot escape that harsh truth. He is so disingenuous that in fact, Labor's policy costings for the 2019 federal election, released by the Parliamentary Budget Office, did not include the reversal of robo-debt. Labor's social security policies that they brought to the 2019 federal election did not include the reversal of robo-debt. And Labor's own budget plan from the 2019 federal election didn't include the reversal of robo-debt and banked the savings of robo-debt to fund their election commitments. In stark contrast, the Morrison government remains committed to the continued improvement of the income compliance program. And the Prime Minister has apologised for any hurt or harm this program has caused. And if we go back to the 9th of May 2019, when Bill Shorten was directly asked about robo-debt system, he said, and I quote, we want to make sure that people aren't receiving welfare to which they're not entitled to, and no one gets a leave pass on that. The Income Compliance Program was developed to make identifying welfare overpayments more efficient. It assisted with reviews where customers didn't respond for fully engaging with requests to clarify discrepancy between income earnings reported to Centrelink and the Australian Taxation Office. Services Australia, as part of its commitment to continuous improvement, has engaged with more than 35 organisations, including advocacy groups in recent times. And it's piloted the first refund process, engaged with the Ombudsman's Office on draft refund letters, and met with the Civil Society Advisory Group with further updates on the agency's progress in refunding customers. In fact, the Commonwealth Ombudsman, in his most recent report, 
commented positively on the enhanced customer experience, including improved letters and income compliance correspondence. From July this year, Services Australia commenced repayments made on debts using income averaging based on ATO data. The number of debts or debt notices raised wholly or partially using income averaging of Australian Taxation Office data is approximately 525,000. The total value of refunds, including recovery fees and or interest charges, is estimated at 741.6 million. 430,000 people will have their debt zeroed. And of these, approximately 378,000 people will also receive a refund, and approximately 52,000 won't receive a refund as no repayment was ever made. But with regards to refunds and the progress made to date, as at 30 November 2020, 4,689 people have had their refunds completed. That means they've been processed or their debt zeroed with a total value of $700.7 million in refunds paid, about 95 per cent of people and 95 per cent of refunds by value. So approximately 134 and 50 former customers have completed the online task for a refund with payments being processed, and approximately 23 100 people are still to be refunded or have their debt zeroed. Of these, 10,150 customers require tailored servicing by Service Australia due to their individual circumstances such as incarceration or bankruptcy. And then we've got 12,950 former customers need to complete their refund pending task in MyGov to trigger their refund. There's also been advances in simplifying the income reporting, with 1.2 million income support recipients who report earnings will benefit from a simpler way of reporting their employment income. From 7 December 2020, income support recipients will find it easier to report their income by using their, found on their pay slip rather than trying to calculate what they've earned in a fortnightly entitlement period. Order, Senator Hughes. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now move.